All right, so 10 a.m. we're going to get started here. Thanks for joining the webinar today. Uh, hopefully it's not too cold where you are. I'm out on the West Coast and there's about a foot of snow on the ground, so looks like it's everywhere in Canada these days. Um, so a little bit about CGIS before we get started. Uh, our vision is a world without valve problems. So we're a knowledge-based company and we love sharing that knowledge with our customers to help make sure they uh, select the right valve for the application whenever they can. Uh, CGIS represents best-in-class manufacturers of isolation valves, control valves, and automation. So geographically speaking, if you're not familiar with us, we are throughout Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. We do have um, brick and mortar offices in Vancouver, Edmonton, Prince George, Brampton, and Montreal, as well as Adelaide in Australia. And we also have sales representation uh, in Saskatchewan, Newfoundland, and Hamilton. And that is both the Canadian Hamilton and the Hamilton in New Zealand, which I just learned about. So uh, we offer a wide variety of valves and automation. However, I would say our niche is really where the application demands higher quality products and expert advice for success. This really trickles down from Ross Waters, who's our founder and chairman. Ross has been very influential in the valving industry and continues to, to work hard with MSS to accurately define what a severe service valve is and, and where they should be used today. So next slide, please. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. We want this to be as interactive as possible. So if you have questions uh, during the presentation, feel free to, to shoot them through and I'll um, kind of manage them for Brayden. Uh, you can do it through the Q&A box preferably, but you can also chat to us directly. There's two options there. Uh, next slide. So on the line today, uh, Braden Waters is our, our speaker today. He's been in the valve industry for 23 years, and uh, you may recognize his last name from uh, the founder as well. <laughs> uh, he's been working throughout his career with a variety of different valve uh, products, but when it comes to butterfly valves, he has experience with Bray, Jamesbury, Durco, and Ebro. Uh, and also joining Braden is Fareed Hajipur, and he has 25 years of working experience with Ebro, and he is our, our internal uh, CGIS expert on that product line. So with that being said, I'll let you take it away, Braden. Awesome. Thanks, Sammy. Uh, perfect. Well, thanks, everybody, for joining. Um, one of the things uh, we really recognize at CGIS is um, within valves, there is a lot of uh, nuances and, and differences within design that uh, um, allow some valves to last a um, few months and other valves last uh, many, many years. Um, when we start talking about chemical services and more uh, fit for purpose and severe service applications, I think it's important to recognize some of those differences uh, um, in those designs so that um, when you're selecting or um, trying to pick the best product for the application, uh, you can recognize some of those differences. Uh, so what I would like to do today is uh, take you through uh, a little bit of um, basics on butterfly valves just to start to uh, identify uh, the different types um, and uh, some of the uh, things that we look at. Um, and then we'll go and look at uh, resiliency to butterfly valves and some of the differentiators to consider um, when using those for chemical uh, services. Um, really resiliency to valves um, have been used mostly for general purpose um, applications um, in the, in the um, true resiliency to versions. Uh, the Teflons obviously get into the fit for purpose and severe service and that's where we'll uh, we'll focus on uh, the, the more de uh, critical uh, applications with the Teflon line valves um, and then we'll touch on high performance butterfly valves as well. Uh, so just some of the basics. Uh, butterfly valves have been around for uh, you know many many years uh, being used as uh, flow control devices. Really when they got their start uh, that's what they're used for is for uh, control or flow control <clears throat> rather than isolation. It wasn't really until the uh, the 50s and 60s with the advancements of synthetics and uh, uh, fluoropolymers, fluoroelastomers, that really allowed them to break into the, um, the isolation valve market. We've seen a lot of, um, uh, of improvements with materials, especially over the last 20, 30 years, that have uh, allowed them to be a, a very good isolation valve. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, I think today, still in the industry, uh, there are manufacturers that focus on the control side. And maybe don't have uh, the isolation capabilities needed and so butterflies sometimes do get a bad name for themselves if they're misapplied depending on their uh, um, their construction <laughs> Excuse me. 
Um, within North America, the standard that we uh, re reference most often is API 609. And uh, uh, this uh, looks at things such as testing, um, uh, material face-to-face uh, uh, -face, uh, as well as uh, breaks the butterfly valves, uh, valves up into two categories category a and category b category a butterfly valves are reserved for um, or resiliency to butterfly valves uh, and teflon line butterfly valves um, these ones are um, ha have a cold working pressure that is determined by the manufacturer and not set by api 609 Whereas category B are, are double offset and triple offset butterfly valves and meet uh, an ASME class, usually class 150, 300 and 600. I'm sorry, I have battling the cold here and I was worried about the coffee here. So within the um, category A butterfly valves, um, the resiliency to valves, they, um, they work on what's called an interference fit. Um, this is where <clears throat> the outer diameter of the disc is greater than the inner diameter of the seat. And it's the interference between those two components that create the, the isolation and the shut off pressure for the valve. Um, this does mean that there is a, <laughs> sorry guys. This does mean that there is friction and, and wear between those two components as they, uh, um, operate open and close. Um, and that's something to consider with, uh, with these types of valves. Being category A and, and their cold working pressure being determined by the manufacturer, normally you see these rated to 10 bar up to 16 bar or 250 PSI, um, but uh, definitely not full as any pressure, pressure class. Um, the one thing to consider with these types of valves when used for chemicals is that the two wetted parts are the seat and the uh, and the disc, um, and therefore the body and the shaft are in a working valve is uh, not going to be uh, in come in contact with the uh, the media. Uh, therefore, as long as we can maintain the reliability of the seat and the disc, uh, these valves should uh, function fairly well in, in service. <clears throat> Um, on the other side, category B valves, uh, these are our double offset and triple offset butterfly valves. <coughs> our, the double offset are position, uh, position seated our, uh, um, and do have an inter interference fit, a little less than a resilient seated butterfly valves, usually three to four degrees of rubbing. Um, whereas triple offsets, in their camming action have a true, um, <coughs> Sorry, guys, I'm really struggling here. Uh, <clears throat> they have a, a true um, non-rubbing um, it, when it comes into the uh, to the seat design. Um, the the other consideration here with category B is that they're full ASME pressure tested, so they'll meet the pressure uh, and temperature class of uh, <laughs> ASME B sixteen point three four. Um, <clears throat> all right. Hmm. When we talk about, um, again, resiliency to valves being used in chemical service, the, uh, the most critical part is the, <laughs> sorry, Freddie, do you mind to maybe take over for a bit? I'm going to put you on the spot here. <clears throat> yeah. Hi everyone. Uh, apparently, the person has a problem with the allergic <laughs> seasonal allergy. Uh, <clears throat> regarding the seat uh, stability of the ever resilient valves, and the most uh, high tech part of the ever resilient <laughs> butterfly valve is the liners. And as you see, that's the uh, because of the special instruction of the liners and profile is like a, a tongue and groove in the body, and there is no even small movement during the uh, functioning the valves or operating the valve. And uh, of course, it's a replaceable, but uh, the other uh, advantage of the Ebro uh, butterfly valve, concentric butterfly valves. Uh, as you see, that's because of the 
pre-lubricated uh, bronze bearing in uh, on a shaft, there is no uh, contact uh, be, uh, metal to metal because of the three O-rings that smoothly moving on a bearing, uh, the bronze or brass, uh, uh, the bearings. And of course, <clears throat> reducing the, the torque of the valves. And that's why uh, we always, we can use the, the um, economical uh, actuators because the lower sizes uh, of uh, the, the, the actuators. And uh, then, and we have a different material for the body. As you know, that's the body's uh, non wetted parts that, uh, but the steel, we have an option to deliver or make the bodies with the uh, carbon steel, ductile iron, cast iron, and of course the stainless steel. Uh, uh, can I see the next? Uh, slide or you you want to handle it? Are you better? <laughs> I'll keep uh, keep going here though. Thanks, uh, Fried. Um, yeah, so as uh, Fried mentioned, the uh, the seat design in the Ebro is uh, has some definitely some consideration. So the uh, the center guiding ring, <clears throat> much larger stem seal with uh, O ring molded into the into there to create a, a better uh, connection between the the shaft and the on the seat, uh, as well as a tongue and groove that fits inside the machine body here to really keep that stability. One of the issues with butterfly valves and where they fail in resilient seated is that every time that disc comes into the seat, it wants to warp the seat. <coughs> and that creates a potential leak path um, up through the disc, through the shaft into the behind the body. And as that happens, more media gets behind there and uh, uh, the torques can increase and more friction and more warping can happen. So really a stable seat is the critical uh, aspect that we look for in uh, the resilient seat about butterfly valve. Um, when it comes to the shaft and uh, disc design, this is another piece that we look at. Um, the, the preferred method is a one piece shaft with internal connection to the disc. The alternative is a two piece shaft with internal connections. <coughs> what we try to avoid is uh, torque plugs or disc pins that expose the, uh, potentially can expose the shaft to the media. Um, this one in particular was uh, corroded away in a, in a salt brine solution, uh, which once that plug is uh, compromised, uh, your shaft is able to turn without moving the disc, which can be very detrimental to your application. Uh, as for you to mention as well, the, uh, the advancements in materials have really uh, come a long way. <clears throat> really, you know, for many years, resiliency to butterfly valves has been limited to stainless steel discs, uh, maybe some coated discs, as well as EPDM or Buda N seats. Uh, we're seeing today a variety of different materials, um, uh, Vitons, uh, Hypalons, which are good for acids, as well as uh, uh, super duplexes, Hastelloys, and other materials for the discs. Uh, which allows us to get into a uh, greater uh, range of uh, chemical applications. Um, just pointing out uh, when it comes to sulfuric acid, again, I, we wouldn't recommend this valve for a severe service uh, uh, sulfuric acid, but if there's a media or an application where um, your valve may come into contact with sulfuric, upgrading from a stainless steel uh, disc, which is limited in the range ability of, uh, of sulfuric, um, to a uh, super duplex or duplex disc gives a lot more range where we can use that valve uh, safely without uh, corrosion occurring on the uh, on the uh, critical disc and seat area. Um, Free, do you mind this maybe taking them through uh, the last little bit here on the Hebrew? Yeah. <laughs> Recap. Sorry. <laughs> we want. Uh, okay. Uh, as I mentioned already, that's the. Uh, some features or, or features uh, or advantages of Ebro versus the other manufacturers, uh, as you see that the precise machining on the body and uh, using the bush, bushes or, or bearings, lubricated bronze bearings, that's for three parts and the top in the middle and the bottom. And the, as you see, that's the old shafts uh, with the O-rings, they are rotating on these uh, bearings, and that's why uh, we call Ebro a maintenance free. And um, in my uh, business life, I saw 
such a dispatch for 20, 25 years still working because of the, uh, this precise missioning. And uh, the next, okay, if you want to see that in details, that's the show the bearing and bushes with the O-rings on a shaft and retainer, uh, as you see on a shaft as well. And uh, still, okay, this uh, uh, picture, as you see, that's the how uh, the liners is sitting on the body and there is no possibility to any movement during the, uh, the valve operation. And uh, as another advantage that you can see in the Ebro, uh, that's the, the polished uh, or mirror polished uh, surface of the disc. And that's why we have, we can minimize or the valves uh, torque and uh, during opening and closing or on sitting on the liner. Right. All right, thank you, Fred. You're welcome. <clears throat> So um, when we get into more severe services, Teflon line valves is where we turn to for chemical services. They um, normally Teflon seated valves, uh, wafer valves and leg valves are limited to two to 12 inch. Um, some manufacturers do go larger in the double flange version. Ebro goes up to 40 inch in, in this size, but most chemical lines we, uh, we see the uh, two to 12 inch are the most readily used. Like the uh, resilient seated valve, uh, the Teflon line valve, uh, the two wetted parts are the disc and the, and the seat. <clears throat> um, the body is non-wetted, uh, but does employ some other parts that uh, really bolster up the, the shaft ceiling, as well as provide uh, some resiliency to the Teflon using uh, uh, the elastomer behind the seat there. Um, when we talk about Teflon line valves, uh, the most common materials that are, are used for the two materials that are being used are uh, PFA and PTFE. Uh, we are starting to see some modified PTFE or TFM being introduced into the, uh, into the world of uh, Teflon line valves. Um, there, there's a debate out there. Um, and there's a number of uh, debunking the myths when it comes to PTFE versus PFA, which one's better. Um, one of the things that uh, we found is that really the thickness is, is one of the critical pieces, <laughs> but um, they do have some advantages and disadvantages in both, both cases. Uh, P PTA, uh, PFA is superior to PTFE in terms of flexibility. Um, on the other hand, uh, PFA's flex life is lower than PTFE. So uh, you got a bit of a trade-off there. Um, PTFE has, a slightly more resistant uh, to heat than PFA. Um, PFA is more affected by water absorption and weathering, uh, but is superior to PTFE and, and salt spray resistance. So there's, there's trade-offs to both. Uh, but at the end of the day, what we found is that um, really there's uh, very little uh, difference um, between the two materials and some manufacturers prefer PTFE discs, some prefer PFA discs, uh, and usually PTFE seats uh, are the, what's, uh, what's used. Um, like I said, uh, when it comes to permeation, which is something that needs to be consideration, considered, this is where the media is able to find its way through the liner into the substrate. Um, <clears throat> what we look for is a minimum of three millimeters of, uh, T, uh, of PTFE or PFA um, uh, on the, uh, as a liner, um, which really reduces the, uh, the chance of permeation. Um, <clears throat> Like I said, the type of uh, material has some effect, uh, but really temperature and media also uh, something to consider in the, in the, just, uh, with when it comes to permeation. <laughs> Sorry. Um, when it comes to uh, the liner and uh, disc design, uh, this is really where we look uh, to see differences between uh, different manufacturers. Um, well, some of the things we look for is the thickness in the critical uh, areas where they transition. Um, Teflon can uh, fail and, and crack if uh, put under stress. Um, and so a, th a thicker transition edge is, is critical there. Where the shaft protrudes through the seat to uh, uh, into the body is another critical area where we really want to have a very good connection between uh, the disc and the seat to prevent uh, leakage into the, into the body. Um, the amount of friction and, and, and rubbing between the disc and the, uh, the seat is also an area that we look at. Um, some manufacturers will finish machine um, using a, what's called a continuous segmented ball um, machining technique, 
to reduce the amount of wear until the until that disc comes into the uh, final seating area. <clears throat> Um, like I said, the reliable shaft seal is critical to keep the media from getting from the process into the, the non wetted body and, and the other components in the shaft. A um, number of manufacturers will simply push punch through the, the machine seat and uh, create a, a, a lip there for your shaft to go through. Ebro machines theirs and has a very thick uh, engagement between the shaft and the seat, um, which they utilize to prevent, which they utilize to create a very good uh, shaft seal. Um, sorry, Free, do you mind uh, taking the group to this one? Of course. <laughs> okay. Uh, the, as you see that the, uh, regarding the, the multiple shaft CD systems in Ebro, uh, there is a, uh, the, the two ways to the Ebro for uh, assuring the, uh, uh, the customers that there is no uh, leakage from the, the, the media to the body and as you see that you know uh, the first part uh, you see that the washers as a spring a stainless is, is a spring a stainless is, is a spring that the pushing the, the secondary uh, ceilings in the if I want to call in in, in a gray color and and we with the some che chevron uh, o-rings in a TTFP and the white and in a green uh, color uh, we can be uh, sure that uh, the valve is absolute tight and somehow is a gas tight. And of course, in the mid, um, uh, in the meantime, minimum uh, friction between the liner and the uh, the disc uh, uh, PTFE disc. And that's why, uh, beside the have a minimum uh, torque, we will have the absolute tight valves for avoiding any leakage from the media to the body. Yeah, like I said, we I've uh, I've sold a number of Teflon line valves over my career and uh, this uh, <clears throat> their tertiary sealing system is one of the best I've seen when it comes to chemical valves. Um, when it comes to the disc material, um, there again, there's uh, options we can look at. Most common is gonna be your PTFP, disc. Uh, we have uh, conductive or uh, um, uh, PTFE as well. Some applications, modified PTFE has become more common. It's got, it gives us a little bit of a higher temperature rating, a little bit uh, higher pressure ratings as well um, in, 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 uh, for the depth line valves. They have about 10 bar to uh, 16 bar. And, um, and then PFA is the other option there. In terms of price, it sort of goes uh, right to left. So you're least expensive to uh, most expensive um, in, in that design. <clears throat> the other option that uh, we can look at as well with uh, the disc design is uh, non-coated. So <clears throat> we're seeing more uh, duplexes, super duplexes, uh, as well as Hassoys and titaniums, non-coated, um, as well as uh, um, um, our Teflon our coated valves. Um, Reed, do you want to speak to the substrate? Of course. Um, the the disc uh, substrate that you uh, you see that's in the pictures that's what happened for the the coating of the valves. The the best advantage of Ebro I've never seen in my business life that any other competitors make or or any other manufacturer make it. That's the, Ebro basic disc material is a super duplex, 1.4469. Uh, then this advantage goes that if anything happened or for, for uh, the PTFE coated or even the PFA coated, coated uh, this still we have a, a super duplex disc and, uh, and that's a great advantage. And uh, then the other uh, manufacturers cannot meet um the yeah i think yeah i think most of the other manufacturers that we see before use uh usually a ductile or a cast steel uh, substrate uh, which again with permeation or cracking of the coating can really uh, uh, uh fail very quickly yeah um so yeah just to recap i don't know if again sorry didn't, uh, sorry take yeah of course yeah um yeah uh 
as you see there in a concentric or centric butterfly web that Ebro offering always, they have the three bearing as, as you see, and they are PTFA coated bearings. And still we have a smooth rotating of the shaft on it. And uh, with, the, uh, with the minimum, uh, the friction and of course, maintenance free uh, shaft bearing that Ebro can offer with the uh, Teflon valves. Uh, the, uh, again, you see in details that the, how Ebro reached to the, the, the absolute tight uh, position for the shaft between the shaft uh, and the disc. And uh, you see the layers of the safety uh, tools like a washer spring and the secondary uh, bush or, or bearings that you can see. Still, there is a, as you see uh, in the, on the shaft, uh, still, we have a PTFE coated until uh, the middle of the uh, the the bore or the, the shaft hole or shaft uh, uh, yeah uh, the the bore and uh, with the material of chevron uh, Teflon uh, Teflon rings and the the whiten O-rings steel you you have the maximum. Uh, Tightness for the for for shaft and the uh, the disc, and in this picture you see the layer the, the thickness of the uh, PTFE liner as is a minimum uh, is a three millimeter and still it's a good protection for any diffusion. But still, the second layer of the safety is the energizer that you can, you can see in a red color is as a standard Ebro use the silicon, but we have option of whiten and uh, uh, EPDM as well. Uh, again, okay. And you see that's the, uh, regarding the, um, the ISO 5211, there's the uh, top flange standards that uh, make us able that to use the different actuations and the, uh, uh, and and uh, yeah, um, the Ebro as as the European standards normally meet the EN ISO fifty two uh, eleven, and still for uh, emission or a TA luft, as you see on the top flange on the top flange, we have an extra uh, stooling for avoiding any emission or uh, for for meeting the air quality control. It's good. A couple of common pitfalls that we we notice with the Teflon line valves when we see failures is um, two things: either over torquing when the valve has been installed, or the use of uh, gaskets with the Teflon line. Um, you can see in this one, uh, a gasket was used and um, and put additional force on the on the seat. When and when that happens, the Teflon has nothing else to do but uh, flow into the uh, into the disc um, area and increase the torque. Which can damage it uh, prematurely. Um, so one of the things uh, <clears throat> we've learned with uh, resilience seated versus Teflon line valves is that uh, um, with the, the bolting torques, uh, there's usually going to be a, a gap between the, the metal of the body and the metal of the flange. Um, whereas in a resilience seated valves, the uh, the is designed in a way <clears throat> that uh, it needs to be compressed fully in that. So um, the lesson to learn there, uh, gaskets should never be used with resiliency to valves and uh, um, following the, uh, the bolt and torque is critical for Teflon line for uh, longevity and service. Um, I'm just going to quickly touch on double offsets um, as uh, they're um, fairly well known, but one of the things we're seeing again for chemical services is that uh, their, uh, the amount of materials being used uh, today, uh, we're seeing super duplexes and uh, Hastelloys, even titaniums in the Teflon or the uh, double offset valves. Um, one of the things to consider with the double offset is that, uh, um, and the triple offset is that the not only the body, I'm sorry, not in the disc and the seat is wetted, but the body and the yeah, shaft become wetted as well. So we need to consider uh, the, uh, the chemical compatibility for, for these types of valves. They do give us um, some higher pressures and temperature ratings. 
um, <clears throat> and if uh, fire safety requirement, that's something that we need to look at here. <laughs> now, one of the areas that we do need to consider is that, again, the disc to shaft connection. Uh, there's a number of ways to do it. This is, they do tend to employ uh, disc plugs or torque pins in these ones. Um, Ebro welds there is in place so that it uh, there's no chance for it to back off if it uh, is uh, attacked, uh, but uh, definitely something we look at. The other piece we look at is the the use of uh, live loaded packing. This is critical to, again, prevent any leakage out to atmosphere. And uh, with uh, these being used more in the chemical services, we're seeing new standards come out from Europe and stuff that uh, require enhanced uh, stem sealing. Um, the seal design in the double offset is quite a bit smaller than the resilient seat, less shrubbing, like I said, <clears throat> but uh, 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 something that uh, we need to consider because it is a wetted part, obviously. And uh, um, some options there with uh, PTFE, modified PTFE, also umpy for uh, wear resistance. Um, as I mentioned, uh, we are seeing some standards coming out of uh, out of Europe, uh, PAS 1085, designed specifically for the chemical industry. Um, they're demanding no uh, clamping rings on the outside of the, uh, uh, the seat clamp here, um, so that's being moved behind the seat. So no area for chemicals to uh, um, uh, to stand stand there. <clears throat> Usually a longer neck for uh, enhanced uh, stem sealing. Uh, they, we've also seen the need for the stop to be moved from the, the waterway into the shaft itself, um, and really trying to extend the life of the valve through uh, uh, maintenance-free designs. Um, so just to wrap it up, there's you know there's a number of uh, butterfly valve uh, improvements designs that have uh, happened that uh, lend themselves nice to be used in the chemical industry. Um, we're seeing there's a number of other you know considerations as well, um, <clears throat> plastic valves, PVC, CPVC, PVDF are have been used for uh, a number of years in the chemical industry. Some advantages and disadvantages to them, um, uh, non-metallic. Uh, uh, bodies for corrosion re resistance uh, uh, being considered sometimes. Um, Samson's got a very interesting valve. They've got a, uh, a, double, a, a, a true double offset uh, Teflon line, which is one of the only ones I've seen in the market. <clears throat> Great for control, uh, for control applications. And they actually employ an eight millimeter thickness uh, when it comes to their seat and, uh, and disc, so a lot, a lot thicker. Um, so really it's done itself to uh, uh, preventing any permeation in, that, in those designs. So um, just uh, leaving remarks, um, I know there's, uh, we obviously we always want to know what the application is. We want to consider <laughs> the different uh, uh, chemicals, temperatures, pressures, um, but uh, butterfly valves have definitely come a long way and uh, something that can be considered as an economical solution for isolation and control when it comes to uh, the chemicals. So uh, um, again, thank you for your time. Apologize for the uh, the coughing and uh, thank you Fried for stepping in and, uh, and yeah. taking over some of those times but uh, if there's any questions we're happy to uh, um, uh, yep. do, uh, come over there. We did have one question come in earlier on it was how many years can you guarantee for gas tight? Um, it's really dependent on to a number of factors so how often it's isolating um, um, and and um, stuff like that. So if you're talking about fugitive emissions, um, it, uh, <clears throat> it's, it's going to depend on, on uh, that. But we've seen valves of Cerberus for uh, you know, five, 10 years, no problem. Um, but it really depends on the application. Uh, so um, the, the media, as chloric versus sulfuric versus chlorine, uh, the size of the particles when it comes to permeation is going to be a have factor, as well as the temperature. Find that uh, the higher temperature, the faster the permeation occurs. Um, and to combat that, we go with the, you know, the thicker the material. Um, some Teflon line valves on the market <clears throat> utilize a very thin layer, um, and they'll be more susceptible to uh, um, media leaking uh, through that. Um, so it's a, it's a bit of a hard question, but uh, if you have a specific application, we could take a look and uh, um, see what our, uh, our installations have used before. <laughs> 
Sure. Uh, another question just came in. It says we have a hydrogen application for butterfly valves. Gas is high. Hydrogen content, a small amount of oxygen, 2.6 mole, is water saturated and has chlorine present. Can you comment on a valve recommendation? Um, we're just starting to uh, mark. Sorry, probably David take us. Pressure is low, less, low. Less, less than 50 PSIG. Yeah, you know, we're just, uh, obviously hydrogen is becoming a, a massive uh, um, buzz right now. There's a lot going on. Um, Samson's actually uh, been doing quite a bit of work uh, as well as Ebro on this. Um, so it's okay with you, I'd like to take this one away and uh, and reach back, um, reach back to you and just uh, take a look on that one because um, there's definitely uh, some advancements uh, on, on uh, that front sure we can follow up with that um there was another question are the valves aisi certified compliant um so the so uh, as, um are you, are you talking ANSI, i believe ANSI, yeah. i mean ANSI, yeah. ANSI, yeah. ANSI, yeah. ANSI, yeah. so um the uh the class category b so the double offset, triple offset will be ASME compliant in terms of pressure temperature ratings. So they'll meet, um, they'll meet the, you know, depending on the body material, they'll meet the uh, pressure temperature rating of uh, the different uh, uh, categories of uh, material in ASME B16.34. Um, your resilient seated valves, uh, because they do not meet the full pressure temperature rating won't be I won't meet as we be 16.34. However, dimensionally, they'll match up against uh, class 150 piping. And so that's one thing to consider is that, um, like I said, usually resiliency to valves um, are rate body rated <clears throat> to 10 bar, 150 PSI, um, or 250 PSI max in some cases. So they're not full rated to the, the piping class. <clears throat> Um, and that's often the case because uh, the application doesn't call for it. Um, you know, most chemical lines are going to be lower pressure, um, and uh, um, the valves are will, will meet the, the pressure uh, rating of the, of the application. Okay, um, got another question. It is, what is the best design for hot process water? Um, again, depending on uh, the pressure and temperature uh, and how hot. If it's, um, if there's, um, I, I, for me with the advancements, and maybe touch on this too, but with um, with some of the resiliency to butterfly valves, especially if there's chlorides in the water, one of the things we're seeing is that um, with the duplex disc of uh, uh, the Ebro, it's a very inexpensive, let's go back to uh, this design here. Um, especially if it's large board, these valves here, um, could be a very good option um, as long as the pressures are, you know, under uh, 16 bar and uh, the temperatures are uh, within range. But for hot process water, I think we should be we should be good. Um, but with a duplex, if there's if there's chlorides in the hot process water, uh, this can be a, a good option um, to consider. Now we're seeing definitely, you know, um, where ASME requirements are demanding. Uh, double offset or triple offset, uh, then we're seeing uh, um, double offsets and triple offsets being employed a lot more in the old sense. Um, and, uh, um, and so that's that's what uh, that's sort of driving that is the need for a full asthma class rated valve, regardless of the fact that the material is not, or that the application doesn't need to get that. Okay. Uh, I think we have another question that might be good for, for Reed. It is, what is the benefit of using a non-coated duplex disc? <clears throat> now I've got the cough uh, over a <laughs> Teflon coated one. Uh, uh, of course, is a, we need we need to uh, investigate regarding the the composition of the media. That's of course for for example. Um, for chemical applications uh, with the dilute HCl, uh, we can use still the super duplex disc instead of the uh, PTFE coated or, or PFA coated. But it depends on the, of course, is a, uh, the composition of the media we can choose for 
for you. But the advantage is, of course, is the cost saving and the less torque and more CV because the three millimeter, uh, the coating on a disc, of course, reduce the CV. And, uh, but for sure, uh, the good thing about the CGIS, we have a very uh, good expert team to be able to investigate for you and offer you best economical and technical options. Okay. And uh, another question just came in. What about seawater applications? Um, example material. Thanks. Okay, this is a sorry <laughs> because for a long time I, I I had experience with the seawater applications in a tough environment uh, with the high chloride and high temperature. Uh, maybe Ebro was the first one that found out that aluminum bronze is not a good solution for seawater, and they can offer the duplex as a best. Uh, material and the good thing about the Ebro, even for offering with offering the Ebro, uh, so a super duplex, uh, the price wise is uh, cheaper than the aluminium bronze, and of course stand more and more. This is my experience in a uh, the Gulf area for a, a more than twenty five years for all seawater intakes or desalination plants. Okay, right on. Yeah, uh, we're seeing a lot more. Um, uh, you know, in the marine industry, uh, we're seeing that become a bit more of a set is the uh, super duplex disc. Uh, and then um, with different, uh, depending on the temperature, uh, uh, with different seat designs is a very economical option. I feel like this next question was seeded for Ross almost, but he's not here. Uh, what is the toughest chemical services you guys have seen? Example, chlorine dioxide or brown pulp stock lines and pulp and paper? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, you know, different considerations. Um, obviously, anything that's going to uh, uh, crystallize uh, chlorine dioxide and things like that um, is is difficult because uh, one of the downsides with Teflon is that it's not very good with uh, abrasives. Um, it's, uh, <clears throat> it, it helps and that doesn't allow things to stick. Uh, so, you know, clean and clear chemicals, um, <clears throat> gases are uh, tend to be easier on Teflon line valves. Um, the ones that uh, tend to uh, crystallize, <laughs> like uh, chlorine dioxide, uh, uh, can can be a bit more difficult. Um, we've used them before with, with good success, uh, but maybe depending on how uh, how much uh, that media is going to precipitate out of the out and, and uh, solidify, uh, maybe looking at uh, going to um, higher alloy titaniums and uh, different types of uh, Valve designs, a ball valve, or something that has a scraper to to prevent uh, that uh, medium from damaging the, the soft seat. Okay, and uh, I was curious, actually, can you explain a little bit more on the machining process for the shaft sealing? Uh, for instance, like why is punching through no good? Thank you, Sam. And uh, sorry, my cough. Uh, <clears throat> go back to that one here. Um, yeah, so what tends to happen if you're, if you're simply just punching through there, um, you're taking um, a machine flat of material and punching it through, <clears throat> it tends to uh, pull on the material and, and thin out certain areas. And so you'll get a thinning um, at the, the critical um, transitions uh, area there. Whereas if you um, have that piece machined into your seat, um, you may take the, uh, uh, the thickness and the, the strength in those areas. And the other thing that tends to happen with uh, Teflon doesn't have a great memory, but it it will um, cold flow and it will um, um, change. And if you're putting it under stress, it will tend to uh, um, move around over time. Um, whereas uh, the machine from a um, out of a, the block of material, it uh, tends to be a lot more stable. Okay, cool. I uh, don't see any more questions now. So unless there are a couple more, we'll probably wrap it up here. Um, just an FYI, this has been recorded. So I will send out the, the recording to anyone who registered in case, uh, well, if they weren't able to make it. And uh, yeah, thanks again for, for joining us today. And uh, yeah, have a good one.